Scarlet, and Violet, and Sam. How's everybody this morning? Good. I'm glad to hear that. In the story that we just read, Elisha and Elijah. Elijah's this prophet. He's this leader. He's somebody who hears God's voice and then proclaims it to the world, right? And Elisha is like second in charge, right? And so when Elijah is taken up to be with God, Elisha is left in charge. Make sense? And Elisha asks Elijah, you know, please, when you go, I would like, like a double, it says a double measure of your spirit, which means to be just, just as powerful as you, just as, as to hear God's voice as, as, as clearly as you do and to, and to, um, to really, um, be able to be bold and, 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 you know, and just as filled with God's spirit as you are, right? So Elisha says, you need to look at me while, I, while I'm ascending and don't look away. Have you ever had a staring contest? Have you ever had a staring contest? Do you ever do that for fun? Violet says yes. Sam, gosh, it's been the longest time since I've been a staring contest. If we had one now, anybody want to do a staring contest? No? No? Okay. All right. So you got to look at this and not look away. And he does it, right? And then we read, because there had been some water, right? And Elijah was able to part the water and walk across, just like Moses, right? And so then Elijah sends, there's Elisha, he picks up like, the, like a stole that I wear on, on, on Sundays, which is that long, thin thing, which of course I'm not wearing now, but it would have been a good idea if I had, but anyway, on, normally on Sundays, right, puts that on, and then what does he do when he's going back to, to see all the other people? He tries to part the water just like Elijah does, and we read, he did it, right, and oh, he must have been like, yes, God, right? What I think we can take away from that is we're called to put into practice the things that God is calling us to, right? He's been a student. Elisha, these names are funny. It would have been easier if it was Bob and Tom or, you know, but it's Elisha and Elijah. Elisha has been watching Elijah for a long time, right? Right? And the first thing he does when, uh, is, is he tries to do it himself. And that's what we're called to do. We come to worship every Sunday, and we come to worship God first and foremost. But we also come to learn, and then to be, to be challenged to live differently when we leave, right? To apply God's teachings to our lives, and then practice them when we leave. And we're not always going to get it right, but we're going to try, or that's what we're called to do. Does that make sense? Like in the same way you learn, you know, you know, some of the stuff in school, you might be wondering, why am I learning this? But there's things that are really, really practical that, you know, that you put into practice, right? And we learn as, we're, as we get older, and we all keep learning our whole lives, which, is, which makes me really happy and hopeful that we can still learn things, no matter how old we are, right? So you're at the beginning of it, some of us, keep going or we all keep going right but for, I, to me the idea that we can always be growing and always be learning is just that's that's wonderful and hope so I think we're going to pray and then we're going to ask for God's help as we practice um, as we practice putting into practice what what God calls us to and I think I'll talk about how God calls us to love one another Right? So if you'll fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your heads, I'll pray for us. Gracious God, we pray that you would bless us as we try to live out your teachings. Some are easy and some are really hard. Lord, help us to be gentle with ourselves as we make mistakes. 
But, Lord, may we never give up trying. We pray this in faith and in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let me tell you how I normally approach this passage. You're getting a two a two for one sermon this morning. First one is the abbreviated version. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem, which is an idiom, an expression of the time. It means he's determined. He has recognized that his incarnational ministry is coming to an end. And going to Jerusalem means that he will be arrested, tortured, crucified, resurrected, and then ascends. And if you'll notice in the passage, it says that the destination is to be taken up, the ascension, not the crucifixion, not the resurrection, which is really interesting. I don't know what it means, and I'm just going to leave that there. But it's enough to go, ooh, that's fascinating. We have in this passage a determined and resolute Jesus. He's saying goodbye to earthly comforts. Normal social conventions and priorities will now take a back seat. That to, to which I'm called demands all of me, he seems to be saying. There's no looking back. That's another way of putting the three responses to the would-be disciples on the road. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Say goodbye to earthly comforts. Let the dead bury the dead. Social conventions are going to take a back seat. And no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. We are all called to put God and God's call first. If you're going to follow Christ, follow, follow Christ. I have a, a collage in my office a few lengths ago. A few lengths ago, doesn't that sound good? A few lengths ago, uh, we did a, a crafting uh, morning at the church and encouraged people to make collages based on scripture passages. And the one that I chose was no one who puts a hand to the plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. And the collage has rows uh, that I made out of scripture from, from an old Bible. And uh, Christina from Andrew Wyeth is looking towards the tree of life with a barren tree behind her. So her, her eyes are focused the way that I pray that my eyes are focused ahead following Jesus. Of course, what you need to know, because somebody I was reading someplace that says, you know, when modern farmers, they do look back to make sure that their rows are straight. Yeah, but they're in a tractor. 
old, in Jesus' day, a farmer uh, would have a, the, the plow in two hands, but would guide the, the, the animal in front by a strap that was either t attached to the back of the head or the shoulders. And if you move to the left or the right, the animal would move, and then your rows would not be straight. So that's where that expression comes from. So sermon number one is determination. The gospel of Jesus Christ is worthy of our all, our fierce dedication to following Jesus, who was willing to forsake all for us. And now here's another run at this passage. Jesus and the disciples are in Samaria. Samarians are descendants of Jews and Assyrian occupiers. They differ in worship because Samarians believe that the center of worship should be Mount Gerizim, Gerizim, and Jews believe that the center of worship should be Jerusalem. That's the big argument, which sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds like to, if, if you had ever had a, a sibling that you shared a room with when you were a kid, it, it's like putting tape down the middle of the room and saying, you can't come on my side. Am I the only one who did that? Right? And then your sibling goes, but I have to go to the bathroom. I don't care. Jump, you know. Right? It seems silly. But just think of all the divisions we have in a Christ, the Christian church and our, because we can't agree on things. The, the Eastern church and the Western church separated because, because it wasn't just one thing, but, you know, one, what, should we have leavened or unleavened bread at communion? That was a big deal. Uh, and the derivation of where, where does the Holy Spirit come from, that was the big deal. That's, that's where the split came as if any of us can know for certain. We deal in mysteries. But we are zealous in our pursuit to be faithful to Christ, to follow Christ. In this passage, the disciples are also zealous. James and John, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down and consume the Samaritans because they didn't show us hospitality? That's, that's why. And, you know, as if they could. You know, Jesus, it's, in scripture, it says that Jesus rebuked them for saying that. If Jesus were from Long Island, he would have said, oh, this should be good. Let me get some popcorn. I can't wait to see you try. Right? But he didn't. He says he rebuked them. We're in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan where this person that they think that God is going to rain down fire on is the hero of the story. Following Jesus means loving your neighbor as yourself, regardless of what they believe. Sermon number two. Following Jesus means loving your neighbor as yourself, regardless of what they believe. Jesus rebuked their religious intolerance. So we could now talk about interfaith tolerance and intolerance and how do we do evangelism. Uh, but we could just talk about how Christians disagree. We could talk about baptism. Should, it, should we baptize adults or children? Should it be immersion? Should it be sprinkling? Should, how, how about communion? We could, there's been lots of divisions in the church about that. Or, or want to talk about dancing or women or abortion. This is our context. There are anti-abortion Christians and there are pro-choice Christians. Do we call down fire to consume them, the people who disagree with you? Jesus would rebuke us. And just for your information, for the Presbyterian Church, there's division in the Presbyterian Church about this as well. We are not all of one mind. I was just on, on Facebook, and I saw a, the, the administrators of the PCUSA page were reminding people about how they speak to one another, and, that, you know, and I'm like, oh, I know what the conversation's going on there. Right? But we are currently a pro-choice denomination. And I'm assuming that we as a congregation are all, we are not all of one mind. 
I am not going to try to convince you either way. But I am going to try to convince you to love one another in Jesus' name. And to think about what that love looks like. We live in a culture that would rain down fire to consume the opposition. We hear angry rhetoric all the time. A friend who is pro-choice wrote to me this week saying, I'm so sad to hate them all so much. And my response was this, I absolutely understand what you're saying. My thoughts have scared me at times in recent years. My mantra then becomes, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you again and again and again. And then I pray that I do not become that which I hate. Jesus has given us a path to follow, a road to hoe. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And it's hard. It goes against social conventions. It requires our determination. We can't look back. I happen to join the morning devotional group uh, that meets 9 o'clock every morning online, or I, you can call in. I'm uh, more often than not in my car from, uh, from 9 to 10, and I try to join once a week. And uh, several weeks ago, somebody brought up abortion and my phone, my phone was muted in the car, and I said a little prayer, Oh, Lord, have mercy. Here we go. Maybe you've been at a gathering where you know, somebody brings up something that's going to be controversial that you know that uh, not everybody's going to agree, and somebody goes, No, 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 we're not doing that today. We're not doing that today. Let's talk about sports and the weather. My family does that a lot. And, and maybe you are sitting on pins and needles right now because what's she going to say? And how's it going to fly? And I'm nervous talking about it, but I believe that it's faithful. I would stay silent, but look at the text. The disciples wanted to annihilate Samaritans because they didn't show hospitality. And Jesus said, that's not who I am, and that's not who you are called to be. To be creators of thy kingdom come, Christians, we've got to learn to love Samaritans. Which doesn't mean we always agree. It doesn't mean that we say live and let live. And we can stand on opposite sides of the barricade and vociferously disagree with one another. But we are called to do so in a way that loves the person. That way we maintain our identity as a follower of Jesus Christ. to remind yourself that Jesus loves the wrong-headed nincompoop on the other side and calls us to do the same. That is our work, face, face forward, no looking back. And by the way, the devotional group did really well with the conversation. I was really, really impressed. It seems to me that people were really listening to one another, uh, and, there was, and there was not wholehearted agreement. And I think what makes the, the difference was the desire to understand, the desire to remain in relationship with one another. There was love and respect in the interaction. And again, we don't have to respect every opinion, but we do have to honor everyone's humanity and seek to love them in Jesus' name. We can oppose one another's agenda, but we are called to do it in love. And we have to prayerfully figure out how to do that. It has been six years since the divisive uh, presidential election of Donald Trump. And I'm hoping six years we can talk about this. But I, I, I don't know what was said from the pulpit. I don't, so, but I'm hoping that you can hear this. After the election, there were a, a lot of women who were upset. A lot of women went into uh, PTSD. And it was because of that videotape of the president uh, bragging about grabbing women by the hmm hmm. And many thought that would be the end of the campaign, that that would be the end of his bid, but as we know, he was elected. 
and for many women who had been sexually assaulted, and I've run out of fingers and toes of the women I know who have been raped. It breaks my heart. But the fact that he was given a pass made some women, and obviously not all, obviously not all women, but made some women feel unsafe. And they were dying on the vine. And suddenly they didn't trust their neighbors. And they came to church, and there were people celebrating down the pews because of the election. And then they didn't feel safe at church. And many pastors were silent because they either didn't get it or because they were afraid to talk politics because we don't do that. And I know of a pastor and female pastor who full-blown PTSD, and she could name it. The Sunday after the Sunday after the election, she stood up in her congregation and she said, "You need to check on the women in your lives. You need to make sure that they're okay, because she was not okay, right?" And the the vehemence, and I could tell you, her the the, the congregation and the, the the community in which she lived, probably 75 percent of that congregation voted for Trump. And the fury that came back at her because they did not want to hear that somehow their vote had somehow harmed women, that, they were, that, that she was implicating them in somehow making a choice that would harm women. We, right? I had a conversation with a sister in Christ who was just dumbfounded with the idea that, that her vote could make other women feel unsafe. Right? But that is what was happening. I'm just naming it. And that is why so many women took to the streets to protest. And again, I hope that's not, that's not news to you. It's been six years. And if it is, then we need to be way braver about the conversations that we're having with one another and get curious about one another. I know, you know there, I'm thinking of one woman from a former congregation who did not have Thanksgiving dinner with her family after, after the election because they couldn't stand to be in the same room to, together. And several years out, they still hadn't talked about it. Help me understand. Help me understand. So it's the year 2022. And there are women in this country who are celebrating that Roe v. Wade was overturned. There are people who are joyous. This has been 50 years in the making. I watched the the daughter of the woman who started the pro-life movement. She's just, her speech, she was glowing. She is so happy. And there are women who are fearful for the future. Who is a Samaritan in that scenario for you? And by the way, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is coming up in a couple weeks in the lectionary, but I'm not going to be here, so I don't know what the guest preacher is going to do. But think about that story. The person lying on the side of the road suffering and people choosing not to see. So I would encourage you to engage your loved ones. Listen. Don't try to debate. Just ask. Help me understand. Because listening is loving. When we listen to one another, we feel seen, we feel heard. And it doesn't, and even if you don't agree, you feel honored and loved and respected. And I warn you, you may be told a story that will break your heart. When the Samaritans stopped to help the person suffering, they had to have exchanged names and stories, and a relationship was born. That's how we heal. That's how we come together. That's how it worked back in Jesus' day. That's how it works in our day. Jesus teaches us to see one another and then calls us to love one another as we love ourselves. It goes against social conventions. It's hard. It requires our determination. But we can't look back. We have to look to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.